Pokemon is a baby game, so what if we added the baby type? And while we're at it, why don't we just add 50 more types on top of that as well? And oh, go on, let's add 100 new moves as well with those new typings. This is Pokemon Too Many Types, a game made by some very talented modders and released in Alpha Rad's Discord server. And I thought, wow, this game looks fun. Let's make it ridiculously difficult with a hardcore Nuzlocke rule set. Our adventure begins as most good adventures do, being kicked out of your house at 10 years old and selecting our starter, which I let my chat vote on and they did select Fennekin. I, I wonder why that is. We check our starter's type and right now it's fire and magic. My first encounter of the game is a boring and flying type Pidub, which I then found out that boring type is actually really good in this game, at least for the starting section. Then we captured a dog that has channeled its inner rage into a Pokemon type, making it the Angie type. Look how mad its icon is. Then by the grace of one of the gods that are up there, I managed to find a Ralts, which is a super rare encounter in the next route. And too excited to even check the type, I throw a Premier Ball and it, it didn't work because Ralts is incredibly hard to catch. Nothing that a little weakening can't solve though. And it just takes looking at Ralts' type to realize that this is gonna be a little bit more confusing than I originally thought. Space? Where, where did it come from, Mars? But with the Motley crew in tow, we realized that fire is super effective against angry Pokemon, which is weird because you'd think that angry Pokemon would be fiery in and of themselves. But then I discover that the magic type is based off of Dungeons and Dragon spells, which fills my heart with happiness as someone that has recently played Baldur's Gate 3, thinks it's one of the greatest games of all time, and is now listening to a lot of Critical Role. Then I find and evolve a Cricket Heart, and no one cares about that, encounter and capture a little electric baby, have a little look at the type chart, which yes, this is the type chart by the way, it's so big and hard to read. Then we we capture a very important Badoo. See, Roxanne, the first gym leader, is usually a rock-type trainer, and she's not that much different this time. This time she uses Ancient and Rock Pokemon. So in order to make my Pokemon love me, I sprinted back and forth in a city, holding them for probably around 20 minutes. Until the Badoo and Pikachu realized, oh, this guy is quite nice, actually, and promptly evolved. Now, something cool about this little guy is Pikachu literally has its own type. It is the Pikachu type, which comes with a plethora of different really good moves, actually. Like a Rocket Punch, where it uses boxing gloves. Don't know how it gets boxing gloves on those tiny hands, but after some analyzing on the Pikachu type to see what it's good against, it's pretty solid. Hello, I'm a floating head. Oh, you're, you're a what? How did you get in here? I lockpick the door with my tea. Okay. I'm floating here for a very special reason to tell you about Raid Shadow Legends. Do you mean the sponsor of today's video? Raid Shadow Legends is a free to play game with over 80 million downloads, 800 unique champions. Well, there's billions of ways to customize your champions, new updates every single month and amazing bosses to fight. I'm relaying this information to you so that you can play it while I cannot due to my lack of hands. Or a torso. There's so many different ways to play. There's PvE, there's PvP, you can join clans with your friends. It's a good thing I'm a floating head and not a floating hand or leg so I can tell you that this October raids getting spooky. There'll be tricks and treats this Halloween for those that brave the raid yard. Just download Raid Shadow Legends using the link below, copy your in-game player ID and then venture over to raidyard.plarium.com from October 15th to November 10th. Then venture into the haunted graveyard. Grab a shovel, pick a grave, and start digging as you're in with a chance to get some amazing in-game items and even real-life prizes ranging from epic and legendary Halloween-themed raid champions to Amazon gift cards with a total value of $20,000. And if you're an existing raid player, you can still get involved. At raidyard.plarium.com, you're able to find a special promo code that everyone can use for a small gift in-game. There's a lot in raid and a lot more coming too. Like this month, you can unlock Song Wukong raids take on the Monkey King from Chinese mythology. It's easy to get him too. Just log on for seven days and you can get that legendary champion for free. And even more, if you scan my QR code or use the link in the description, you can unlock the epic champion Talia and get things like skill tomes, energy refills, and experience boosters. So thank you, Raid, for sponsoring this video. I'm going to go back to the land of the flying heads now. But now it's finally time for the first gym battle with Roselia and Pikachu in tow. We face off with a boring, ugly rock. They really didn't have to do Geodude like that. He's done nothing wrong. 
He files his taxes on time. He feeds his kids. There's no need for this type of slander, but it does die immediately to a mega drain. Then Ball Toy enters the arena, which is ancient and psychic. And ancient does not work the same way as rock type does. It has its own move called fossilize. But no matter how many times it used fossilize, it still rapidly dies when it's getting sucked on by my Roselia. So Mew annihilates it easily. And then we have the Lily, which of course, I'm gonna make new types for a game. You couldn't forget Sus, could you? No, oh, really, like they they could have forgotten it. We try to mega drain it, but it does absolutely no damage whatsoever. So doing a little bit of a mental arithmetic in my head, I try to figure out what these types are weak to without checking the type chart because my brain can't comprehend all of the numbers. So you fire off a Pikachu type rocket punch and that also doesn't work. But then I have an absolute cracker of an idea as I'm accessing every brain cell I have at my disposal. I come to the conclusion that space must be super effective on sus because when you eject the imposters in Among Us, they go into space, they die in space, and it takes down the lily. I thought I was huge, massive brain, very smart. Uh, but it turns out that space is super effective on ancients, not sus. So I only felt smart for about five minutes. I help an old man get his flying rat back. We go on a little bit of a boat trip, take a break for a spot of fishing so I can find an ugly fish, catch a geodude for some reason. And then it's time for gym number two. Now you may be catching on that these gyms are two types instead of one, because when you have so many at your disposal, you might as well have every gym be two types. And it's a bit hard to tell when you're actually playing this, but I think this is a fighting in these nuts type gym. Yeah, no, I know. But also, a lot of the Pokemon in here are stinky type, which makes sense because it is a gym. You're supposed to smell bad there. But we had finally evolved the Fennekin starter Shani into a Braxen, which means that yes, it, it did become the furry type. Much to the applause of all the Tumblr users out there. All five of them. But fighting our way through the stinky D's nuts fighting gym, I'd made a terrible mistake. I'd gone into a corner with a dull battle and overestimated how powerful Shani truly was. As Shani took a lot of damage from the Rioli, the Machop came in with a Karate Chop, seemingly super effective on either Furry or Magic, and immediately decapitated Shani. As Shani's lifeless body hit the ground, a wave of regret and sadness washed over me. I had let my starter die because of my hubris, because of my own mistakes. If I had simply healed Shani before it entered the battle, it probably would have had a much better chance at living. If I had simply checked the type chart to see if it was weak to fighting type moves in the fighting type gym, but no, I had made those mistakes and now I live with the consequences. Turns out if you punch a furry, it hurts them quite a bit. And I'd also realized that hardcore Nuzlocking a brand new game where I had no idea of any of the types was potentially not the best idea I've ever had. But I laid Shani down to rest as there was fighting to be done. We start off the battle against Mankey, the Angie type and the Monkey type. And if I know anything about monkeys, it's that they're weak to leaves? Well, no, not really. That one lived. But he did get sucked by a leech seed and went down. Then Sork came out. A massive raging titan of the D's nuts type. Do you get it? Do you get the joke? Do you get the joke yet? Do you understand? Do you know what the joke is? Thankfully, he doesn't have any D's nuts moves, although I really don't want to know what those are. It picks up a poison from my flower. And that's when I realized that Boren type is actually really, really useful here as it resists the double kick. And Diglett is able to just fire off some air cutters to do massive damage with flying type moves. And not just that, but its boring moves are actually really good. Eventually it cuts down the Machop, sending waves of air-based shockwaves at the enemy, seemingly boosted by the sadness of its friend being cut down in front of it earlier on in the day. Now with a vendetta against Machops, Diglett takes down the enemy and claims the second badge. After turning my ugly fish into an angry fish, we found a Typhon that confused me for a little bit. Welma. Oh, water friend? Sm Smack. Smash. Does that type mean what I think it means? Turns out the Smash type is every Pokemon that Markiplier said that he would smash when he did his Smasher Pass, which I I'm not here to judge. I'm just a little bit confused. The Route 21 battle against May goes relatively well. Do we face off with a Vibes type Lombre? No, I'm not kidding. Use the power of Pikachu to defeat Vibes. And then we see Brion is a silly type, which is just really cute. But unfortunately for Brion, silliness can't stand up to the pure, unadulterated rage of an angry fish. Or oh, oh, actually, it can. I did nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, it turns out silliness is actually really, really good against 
anger, which you just think it would make the people more angry, but I suppose it depends on the situation, doesn't it? And we also found another typing that really confused me. 69 experience, of course. Snova is... a little grass guy? Snover's a Democrat? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Obama! But with the confusion dealt with, we prepare ourselves to take on the third gym. And Watson is a user of Prime Pokemon, which is a type that is exclusively made up of Pokemon whose Pokedex numbers are Prime numbers. And also Prime is ridiculously good. It's super effective against all of these different types. It is absolutely insanely strong. So we knew this was definitely going to be a tough fight as I immediately get staticed by the Porygon. And a singular move brings me down to 19 points of health. And now a conundrum befell me. How could a type that does so much damage be defeated? We decide to pivot into Mew as it starts a hype train and immediately crits me. A hype train is very much similar to Rollout as it just builds damage turn over turn, takes basically no damage from my Mega Drain. So I try my absolute best to take it out. We've managed to just kill it with a magical leap. And then Whimsicott hits the field. A fluffy prime Pokemon with a smile on its face, but behind those eyes lie dread, destruction, famine, as Mew is immediately killed by the prime subscription. A move with a ridiculous amount of power for this point in the game. With our backs against the wall, I go into Kia for an Intimidate, start thrashing around, and it's resisted by Fluffy, and then we get critted by the Whimsicott. I then panic and go into my boring Diglett type, trying to file W9s. But unfortunately, boring is also weak to prime. We don't live long enough to actually file a W9, which would have reduced its attack by two stages because taxes are boring, I guess. And slowly but steadily, as new Pokemon enter the arena, like my ugly song type Loudrids, there's simply nothing that can be done. The growing power of Whimsicott as it focuses on its power, growing it, using the growth move, then firing off prime subs and Teddy tumbles all over the place. The team that we had built up so far was no match. Zeke dies immediately. And as fast as the last whisper of hope, our Pikachu type enters the arena with a rocket punch, barely missing out on the kill and being destroyed by the Prime immediately. And thus ends the first run of too many types. I had underestimated that game. So we promptly begin run number two, choosing Poplio as the starter, naming it Melia and trying our absolute best not to die immediately. Only one guess for guessing what type of Krabby is. I'd be really disappointed if you get this one wrong, to be honest. We take our newfound clawed friend and have it do absolutely insane work against the first gym. With the badge in tow, we have no problems getting back to Doofud, but the problems come in when the fishing mini game comes into play. Because listen, I was playing the game at two times speed and it's, it's really hard to time it, okay? It's not easy. So we grab an ugly fish for the second time. Do about seven years of calculations on what's the most effective move I can use on these nuts. And then Paige manages to make almost very quickly short work of the Sork, but unfortunately is immediately killed by a retaliatory double kick, striking twice into both of Paige's claws. The wrath of these nuts was simply too much for my crab. And after a quick potion from the gym leader, this Pokemon becomes a big issue for Amelia, our Brion as well. Because apparently the silly type isn't good against these nuts. But eventually the day is saved by yet another pigeon as it eats crackers and fires off air cutter after air cutter to easily dismantle the fighting type gym. We eventually make our way back to Watson and his prime type Pokemon. And this time we come with a much better idea on how to take him down. They may have the Prime sub and the Hype Train, but I'm a YouTube streamer, and we don't have either of those on YouTube, which does make it super effective against basically anything that I use, unless I file some taxes. The file W9 attack allows you to drop attack by two stages. Unfortunately, we get critted, but that's nothing a little cracker eating can't do. That's something you can't do on Twitch. So I devour cracker after cracker, as the hype train starts to come in, but our mega brain has developed a plan to deal with it. If you protect the turn that a hype train comes in, then the momentum that the hype train builds up is completely annihilated. So all we have to do is bring it down to minus six attack using the power of taxes and accountancy. Whenever we see a hype train crit us like just then, we can detect to turn off the hype train. And whenever we're too damaged, we just devour more crackers. This strategy works incredibly well. 
And we're able to take down the Porygon. Next up is the Pikachu, which is not a prime type. It's a Pikachu type, which I decide for some reason to use a water type on as we get hit with a massive Pika attack, bringing us down to basically no health. We hit it with a massive thrash, take out the Pikachu, but unfortunately get static, which means the retaliatory strike, the charge beam from the Rotom that just comes in immediately knocks us out. We put the Rotom to sleep with a vibing slow bro and tell it to chill for a second, which does a lot of damage and eventually knocks out the Rotom, but then comes the Whimsicott one more time. I think it's a great idea to try and put it to sleep, but Tucker immediately falls to a super effective Prime sub. So I come to the conclusion that the only thing I can do is file W9s, but even the power of accountancy is not strong enough. We're on the ropes. The team is looking incredibly beaten up right now, and it feels like this may be the end of run two as well. We managed to hit it with a massive Aqua Tail from our huge power Azumarill, but the hype train is just becoming more and more powerful. Too powerful, I would say, but I can still wave dash and it survives on a sliver of health as a massive hype train destroys Azumarill, leaving us only with Amelia left. Our starter. Thankfully, Amelia has a priority move in Aqua Jet, so there's still hope. We fire the one Aqua Jet left, and it just does enough damage to knock out Whimsicott. We won, but at what cost? Our entire team has been slaughtered. We are left with just one Pokemon, and these goobers that I had in the PC. So we take our motley crew of misfits and rejects and try our best to continue on with what we have. We catch a Stantler, which puts us in so much of a better position. We find a coughing in Stinky Path. Yes, that's what Magma Path is actually called in this game. And then we find a freaking Slugma. Yes, hold for applause. Go on, laugh. Do the funny thing. Clap already. Jeez. But after a plethora of Pokemon catching, things start to look okay again. We're gathering some items. We're making good progress here. No one seems to be dying. I'm even using a Forret. A bloody Forret. Although I do love this little fluffy guy. Everything's going well until the fight with the silly ball friends feel. I think that Silly might be good against Silly and it does a good amount of damage, but then he fires back his own squirt flower. And in a tragic squirt flower incident, the water comes out like a jet stream from a fire truck. The PSI being simply too high, Emilia immediately dies on impact with this hyper laser powered squirt flower. And we lose our starter to a Silly friend ball. Incredibly distraught about the whole situation. I catch a dog to make myself feel a little bit better. And then we begin to battle our way through the fire and fluffy type fourth gym in Laverage Town. But make no mistake, despite this being an incredibly cute fluffy gym, these fur balls have some fangs too. During one of the battles against one of the gym trainers, we knock out a Vulpix and then Forrest immediately enraged by what he'd just seen in front of it, fires a spout of fiery hell flames towards my pretty weak to fire type Beware, engulfing it completely in the flames. Beware stands no chance of surviving the torrent of deadly infernal. So now we're downing another Pokemon and it's just a gym trainer as well. But it's okay, right? Usually Flannery's not that tough of a gym leader and it's a fluffy gym, so fluffy type is usually weak to things like water and sharp moves moves that can cut through the fluff. So I decide if it's a fire gym, then it should be a good idea to set up a stealth rocks. That way, all the Pokemon that come into the battle will take extra damage. It just seems like it makes sense, really. So we set up our stealth rocks. We get paralyzed by a warm hug. Not really sure why that paralyzes, but then he immediately hits us with a critical hit snug strike. These new moves are not messing around, mate. My dog dies in front of me, apparently unable to survive a torrent of warm, fluffy goodness directed straight at Selena's heart. The forest sets up a sunny day, boosting fire type moves, and we fire some mud at it until it's dead. But then Nine Tails enters the arena. Takes a little bit of South Rocks damage, but with the sun up, I'm a little bit worried about a solar beam. So we try a mud bomb with Shu just to test the waters. We get lucky with a quick claw popping so we can go first and get smacked with a snug strike. I then decide it's time to Scarpa as Chowder switches in. And then I realize, oh wait, Crab is weak to fire. You ever cooked a lobster before? You have to get a real hot. Then Wiggly comes in and gets left on one health point from another Snug Strike aiming straight at its heart. We managed to take it out with a strength, but we're left with basically no health to work with. Then an Arcanine enters the fray. 
and Wiggly taps into its inner rage. Being an angry type, the power that it gains from seeing Chowder and Selena slaughtered in front of it sets it off into a pure, unadulterated, unbridled rampage. Wiggly immediately knocks out the Arcanine. A Flareon tries to come in and face off with a Wiggly, but it is so angry. It grabs the Flareon with its massive tail and smacks it into the floor until it's knocked out, meaning we can win the gym badge. But the cost again was heavy. I fumbled around in the desert, a bit lost for a bit and caught a sand dial. And then it was already time for the next gym. Now, Norman, the dad, usually uses normal types. And there are technically two normal types in this game. There's normal and then there's normal too. And there's boring as well. So which one of those do you think that he uses? Leave a guess in the comments section. Unless you've already watched Alpha Rad's version of this, then you already know. <laughs> yeah, Floatzel is not normal, normal too, or boring. It's none of those types. It's actually water and furry type. That's right, your dad in this game is a furry type specialist. Which came as a shock to me, because I don't know about you, but my dad doesn't even know what a furry is. But we immediately get paralyzed by the Floatzel using a warm hug, and then it glomps. And Glompin, apparently, is ridiculously powerful. We get paralyzed again, so I can't move. And all of a sudden, things are looking pretty bad. As the Glomp knocks out my Krikatoon, Krikatoon being unable to withstand the cringe of being Glomped by a furry. So then we try Blitzin, the Stantler from before. I was excited to get it. Maybe it can do some good damage. No, it immediately dies to Brine. I'm looking quite stressed. I now am faced with the shocking realization that my dad might Glomp me to death, which would be hopelessly embarrassing. Turns out the furries are stronger than I expected them to be. I try to counter with a fluffy little guy of my own, but then a glomp comes through and immediately executes me. I'm four levels above this guy. What is going on? But then we try to tap into the pure unbridled rage of Wiggly once again. Surely if anyone is able to accomplish this gargantuan objective of taking down this team, Wiggly can, and he starts with a massive strength, annihilating the Floatzel immediately. Then a Vaporeon enters the field because yes, yeah, of course it does. Of course Vaporeon's on the furry team. It's not even furry. But yeah, no, it's it's the meme. It's it's the, it's the funny meme. Are you clapping yet? Do you think it's do you think this is funny still? Do, do you still think this is funny? Uh, anyway, uh, Wiggly uses strength and it does like a ton of damage and it's really good. And Norman's spamming these hyper potions left and right. Unfortunately, Wiggly eventually succumbs to being paralyzed. It's hit with a massive glomp and well, there's really very little that Wiggly can do from this point. It's paralyzed, it's too slow. It will immediately get outsped and glomped once again. And then Wiggly succumbs to its injuries. Too tired to even rage once again. Too tired to rage once more against the dying of the light. Too tired to rage against the invasion of the furries, slaughtering his closest compatriots. So we go to one of our final Pokemon, a Raver, a Crawdont. And a good situation we seem to find ourselves in. The Lopony comes in after the Vaporeon goes down. We're of equal level, surely of equal battle status as well. I try to attack with a knockoff, but the Glom does simply too much damage, leaving us on just two health points. We're able to bring him down to red health, but for some reason the knockoff doesn't knock off the berry, although I kind of thought it would do that, but I guess you just eat it before it gets knocked off, which is kind of weird. The Lopony is too fast. It takes out Raver with yet another Glomp. And I hope I never have to say this word ever again after this battle is done, because my god, with only Shu left at our disposal, Things are not looking great. But we do have the Quick Claw, so potentially it could pop it. Oh, wow, look, there it did. Fantastic. And the Discharge could maybe take out the Lopwani? Nope, not even close. It decides to use Attract because it really had to rub the salt in the wound there. And there's just not much you can do. Being flinched by Glomps, being critted, and I, well, I, I didn't take that so well. Paralyzed or something, come on, man. I fucking flinched, dude. What is this game? Literally, bullshit. Oh my God. I'm gonna have an aneurysm! I'm literally gonna have an aneurysm! Uh, I didn't actually have an aneurysm, but you know, it's pretty close. And thus ended run number two. But run number three is gonna be different, I tell myself, as I once again grab the Fennekin from the starter selection. Well, like father, like son, if you can't beat them, might as well join them. And the first gym goes quite well. I made a promise to myself that run number three would be the run that we won. I also made a promise that if we hit a thousand members, we would do a furry only run of this game, but let's not think about that. The second gym battle is obtained with a combination of filing taxes, eating crackers, and firing incredibly high speed torrents of air at my opponents. And we use the exact same strategy for the third gym once again, crackers detect from the hype train, and of course, more air and more taxes. Oh, but we did get critted by the pouring on, so we unfortunately lost Diglett in the attempt. But the magical powers of our furry type starter was 
just too much for the Pikachu, Rotom, and even the Whimsicott to handle, allowing us to defeat the third gym with only one loss. As we progress through the mountains, wondering what awaits us, we find ourselves a fire baby. Which for some reason I thought using a grass type would be a really good idea until I immediately realized the mistake that I'd made. Thankfully, I had two Gyaradoses on side, but it didn't really help when I realized that I hadn't bought that many Pokeballs, so we ran out trying to catch it. We immediately learned our lesson, entered the suit route, and found the sharpest lad in the land. This bad boy's got a selection of typings that would make even the hard Hardest core game, I think. Uh, I don't know what any of this means. But we were able to catch it, which is a huge get. Battling our way through the story of the game that you've seen far too many times, we face off with Maxi, who has a standard angry hyena at his disposal, which of course I just let an angry Gyarados take care of. And for some reason, he also still just has a Zubat. I, I don't know why. He usually has a goal back here. Very strange. And oh, they has a cargo as well. Oh my goodness. Look at that. Wow. It really absorbs those thrashes though. The liquid D's nuts combination of typing is not to be sneezed at. Apparently Ice Fang is good against these nuts or, or liquid. I'm not really sure which one. I mean, hey, I'd be pretty upset if, you know, someone Ice fanged these nuts. I'm, I'm just saying. And in the route on the way to Laverage Town, I found a Pokemon that I never really thought that I could fight on the side of. A Republican. A Republican that ends up killing my Slowpoke, which is really unfair because Slowpoke's like one of my favorite water types. The right to bear tongue is not an amendment that I agree with. Also, I'm British. I don't know what these things mean. But we develop an idea to take on the fourth gym once again. The entry has has worked really well the first time, so we teach Spikes to cage the Skarmory and then hit up Flannery for the rematch. We immediately start setting up layers of Spikes. It tries to paralyze us, but of course we're prepared. I attached a cherry berry to my Skarmory for just such an occasion, but it, it does just paralyze me again, so it only really bought me one turn. Thankfully, the RNG is pretty good in our favor. We get up three layers of spikes, which is a lot of damage to incoming Pokemon, and also realize that sharp moves are really, really good against fluffy type Pokemon. You can just cut through that fluff well easy. But in my confidence, I started to overestimate the power of Norman and underestimate this Ninetales. It smacks us with a snug strike and just does far too much damage. Not willing to risk Norman's life, I decide that switching out is truly the only option. So I switch into Momo, one of my Gyarados, and it fires a snug strike aimed directly at my heart. The fluffiness was simply too much, and the Gyarados was overcome with softness and happy times. The conflicting emotion in my tiny Gyarados brain overloaded, and he had an aneurysm. Very sad. The rest of the battle led to a showdown between my Sand Slash and its abundance of sharp moves, which easily took down the Ninetales and Flareon. But when the Arcanine came in, everything changed. We were intimidated, which lowers our attack, but it doesn't really matter all that much when we just get flinched. And when we get flinched, you know, again, that's also good. And then it hits us with a flame charge and in the sun, and a crit. It's simply too much for Eggwo to handle. So I swap through the Gyarados in order to get an Intimidate off and cut its attack. Also to stall out the sunny day ever so slightly. We still get flinched by another bite, but eventually we're managed to break through, hit him with a cut a second time claiming the gym badge. After heading into the desert to find a rufflet, we find ourselves once again face to face with the father's furry gym. This time with a plan to make things go a lot smoother. For you see, last time we did not access the primordial energy that could have allowed us to win this fight. Last time, we did not have a crab. As the floatzel goes for a warm hug and we came prepared once again with a cherry berry to cure that paralysis, we activate the Crab Rave. An extremely powerful move that is essentially Dragon Dance. It boosts your attack and your speed. The Furries falter when faced with the sickening power of the Rave. Floatzel immediately goes down, and his low punny follows with no effort whatsoever. Even the Lucario barely hangs on when faced with the Crab power. But we do flinch it, giving it a steadfast speed boost. But knowing that he's gonna heal this turn, I take the opportunity to Rave once again. And like Gohan going Super Saiyan 2 against Cell, the Lucario stands no chance of hanging on. The Vaporeon enters the arena, but I make sure to pet my noodle for a little bit of luck. And with one attack, the Vaporeon is annihilated. Chowder comes in with its raving body, coursing with the energy of crabs and dance at the same time. And all it takes is one step on the Vaporeon to damage it beyond functioning in battle. And we finally beat our furry father. Next, we take a little bit of time to do a side quest for an old man going into new 
Marvel and I find myself a vault orb, because when strange old men give me a key to a long forgotten part of the city that is completely devoid of any human life and tells me to go in there and things will be probably fine, I completely accept and do exactly what he tells me to. I find out that Zangus is a Democrat for some reason. I guess that makes Survivor a Republican. We quite easily take out the admin Shelley and remove their influence over the Weather Institute. And to say thank you, the scientists give us something way better than a cast form. They gave us a ditto. And not just any ditto. A sus ditto that has imposter. This, honestly, one of the best things we could have gotten in the entire game. And now on to the sixth gym badge. Winona has a whole song and dance about how she's gonna beat me. She makes the battlefield groovy and yeah, she is a song and dance type trainer. Which may be weird to hear, but song and dance types are both very, very strong. But not strong enough to live up to Cage's fly moves. As groovy as Ludicolo may be, it's still made of grass. Now that groovy arena that you've seen in front of you increases the power of dance moves and also makes them priority. So now like a young university patterns in a nightclub, the idea of dance is absolutely terrifying me. But we decide to fire off a fly, which immediately annihilates the explode as well. I suppose song or dance are weak to flying because if you're too high in the air, you can't hear songs. Yeah, I don't know how this works. Well, you see Noltaria enter the arena. It is a fluffy type and a song type. And this songbird is strong. It can dragon dance and also has a physical dance move that can burn. Burn. So I decide to fire off a massive sharp cut, which it just manages to live and sets up a dragon dance. Unfortunately though, this Altaria is incredibly greedy. Tries to go for a second D-dance for some reason, allows us to just cut it down. Then one of the world's most underrated Pokemon enters the arena. Yeah, I like Maractus, okay. I decide to go into my crab for some reason against the grass type, which in hindsight probably wasn't the best idea, but the Maractus didn't seem to want to attack me. Just wanted to make it groovy and break it down a little bit. And a couple of vice grips takes it out. Hello, us to grab badge number six. Norman finally evolves into its final form. It doesn't change its type and it's still a fire magic furry. We hatch the egg from Laverage Town, which is a Ponyta for some reason. I realized that Duskull is the gamer type, which I mean, come on, just, just look at him. He, he looks like a gamer. Go on, have a guess. What is super effective on gamers? Because if you guessed grass, then you would be correct. We take out a magma hideout. I find the most Ohio Republican Pokemon I could possibly fight. We take out the Team Aqua hideout and pick up the Master Ball. I use the Master Ball on an incredibly powerful Latios. I release the Latios. And speaking of releasing Latios, Alpharad had popped into the chat during the first stream to warn us specifically about this gym and how it's absolutely absolutely a Nuzlocke run killer. So I made sure to take this battle more seriously than I'd taken any battle so far. Oh, oh and sure giving me a warm welcome. The Dewey Youngins from this gym fled right off saying the world's changing faster than we thought. And then the battle begun. Now the big issue with this gym is that it's the Ohio and gun type gym, which you would expect from Clay. But gun is especially scary because there is a gun type move called shoots which, well, it does what it says on the tin. It's a 160 base power move, which is actually stronger than Hyper Beam. So me being a big brain smart guy figured, well, I mean, massive sea leviathans and steel birds are probably immune to being shot. The Duraludon leads with the Protect, and for some reason, the Metal Sound dropping its special defense goes through the Protect, which is great for me, I'll take that. And Bufalon deported the Skarmory, which brought in Norman the Delphox. Next turn, I use Mage Armor on Norman and fire a Thunderbolt directly into the Duraludon. With that special defense drop, we immediately annihilate it. Next comes in the Hitmonchan, which you may think is a good matchup here, but magic is weak to fighting. Oh, or maybe it's furry. Either way, one of these two is very weak to being punched in the face. But we still figure the risk is worth it as Norman takes a massive mock punch, but then it retaliates with a Psy Shock, taking it out immediately. Kaido unfortunately misses the Aqua Tail that would have taken out the Bufalons, and my, the Bufalon deports my Delphox. Deporting basically just switches out the Pokemon. It's just a funny move. But since the Imposter Ditto came in, it copied the Braviary in front of it, making sure we learned Bear Arms, Rootin, Tootin, Shoot, and Rodeo move moves, which is just great. I mean, just like Ohio Republican type. <laughs> Bear Arms is a Republican version of close combat. Rootin Tootin is the Republican Dragon Dance. So these guys come stacked with some really good moves. So I decide to launch an Aqua Tail to the Bufalons, knocking it out. And the Ditto Bear
bear's arms directly into the braviary, which hangs on on just a sliver of health. And it rootins and it tootins, boosting its attack and speed. But it is the last Pokemon. It's a two versus one scenario, but I really don't want to lose any of my team members. And the braviary bears arms directly into Kaido, but Kaido manages to just barely live on a sliver, firing back an ice fang, wrapping its massive, cold, icy fangs around the neck of the braviary, bringing it to a complete stop and the battle to an end. And then Clay says some more stuff in American. I, I don't know that language. After that, things go pretty well. We take on Maxi with Steven. Then he has this coming to God moment where he realizes maybe destroying the natural habitat and annihilating the sea, possibly not a good idea. I managed to convince Archie he's also an idiot using massive amounts of violence, but Kyogre still manages to escape. Uh, but you know how this goes. Scale the sky pillar. Watch the cutscene. Rayquaza comes down, says, Oi, you lot, bugger off, will you? They run away. And before you know it, it's time for the final gym. One is a bit of a weird one. He is a master of crabs. But it turns out what counts as a crab in this game is a little bit different than what I originally anticipated. But the battle begins and our big old hunk of American birds sets up a root and toot and boost in its attack and speed and immediately slices up the crawdon with a swift wing attack. Crab Dominable is next as the Braviary's massive talons carve into the Crab Dominable's massive fleshy chest. It immediately loses consciousness. Then the Crustle enters the arena. I decide to use the power of friendship, which unfortunately does not do a lot of damage. So the Crustal, now with a speed and an attack boost as well, is looking very threatening. And myself being British, I'm not allowed to use the shoot move. Unfortunately, that Britishness means I can't have full control over a braviary, and a smattering of scattered rocks and stony edges flies directly into Pell, bringing it down from orbit. Once again, we resort to Kaido to do the dirty work and show them what the true Dragon Dance actually is. Kaido's massive tail smacks and quakes the earth, sending the crustal completely off of its footing and knocking it out as it hits the floor. Then, then a champ comes in and it's like, how, how is this? Is it because it has like multiple arms or like what's what's going on here? Regardless, the power of friendship makes short work of it as Kaido channels the strong emotions that has brought to it by its love for its friends. It knocks the Machamp out immediately. All that's left is the Kingler. It smacks us with a crab hammer, bringing us down below half health. And we try to use the power of friendship back. It does a lot of damage, but this Kingler does outspeed us. If we try to attack next turn, it will simply knock us out. So I make the smartest play that I can think of to switch out to Cage to absolutely absorb the hit and then play out the same scene that nature has seen for thousands of years. Crab versus birds, and birds always wins. With a massive crit, its talons dig into the massive meaty claw of Kingler. It flaps up in the air and throws the Kingler around like a wet paper bag, slamming it on the ground and knocking it out. And that is every gym badge. Then as we venture into Victory Road, we find ourselves once again face to face with a sickly child. A sickly child with some big ideas. Using the almost unstoppable power of trans rights. I'm forced to turn to communism in order to win this fight. Wow, that was a that was a weird sentence. It's just a Pokemon game, by the way, just in case everyone's wondered. Communism, the ditto now super powered by the power of trans rights, is able to help us put a massive dent into Wally's team. However, we did have to switch out into Cage. I kind of felt like the villain at this point, and the game certainly treated me like one. As Cage fired off a slash against the Gallade, it fired one back in retaliation, carving straight through Cage's thick hide. It's steel based armor was nothing compared to the piercing power of this Gallade. It simply could not stand up to the damage, and Cage fell in battle. It was thankfully the only sacrifice necessary to beat Wally and open the road to the Elite Four. And what an Elite Four it was going to be. One of the most intense Elite Four runs I had ever faced. With our team at the ready of Kaido, the Angry Snake, Communism, the Sus Ditto, Norman, the Delphox, Crobat, our friends, Stronger the Rapidash, and a new addition, Two Pence, the Kling Clang, we start started our Elite Four journey. First up was Sydney, and he's a user of the silly type. So the first thing in my face is silly dancing friends. And I think, all right, Kaido wants to dance as well. Why don't we just get on with it? We get hit with a massive dizzy punch and oh, that hurts. But thanks to the incredibly generous level cap that is given to us by the documentation of the game, we're pretty high
high levels. Although it does concern me that if we were the same level, that probably could have just killed me in one hit. And it's a spinder. Like, what's going on with that? And unfortunately, Kaido is actually weak to silly type, which makes it a really bad idea to lead with it. But Kaido's never one to back down from a fight. He begins to quake the earth and immediately knocks out the spinder, destroying Joy Boy. And Aqua Tail smacks into the body of the Mr. Ryan, hitting it critically and knocking it out immediately. Then a wall rain joins the arena. A silly little ice ball, which is smacked with the power of friendship and is knocked out as well. Then some silly little guys enter the arena, and they also fall to the power of friendship. Last but not least is a Dracovish, and friend is also super effective against Dracovish as well, so Kaido is able to clear up the first Elite Four member with very little issues. Next is Phoebe, an expert on the gamer type. Thankfully, water is super effective against gamers. I love it when a video game is realistic. Next up, we have Beware, the fluffy gamer. And from what we remember, Fluff is also weak to water. So a waterfall smacks him and it's quad effective and knocking it out immediately. Then Dusk Noir enters the arena. This thing is a ghost gamer and Uno reverse type. The Uno reverse type essentially just reverses the weaknesses and resistances of the Pokemon that it's on. So, Gamer is usually weak to water, but since it's Uno Reverse, it's not weak to water. It's resistant to water now, which makes things so much easier to comprehend. Yeah, don't worry, just give me a massive type char and then add a type that just reverses everything because it makes it nice and easy to understand. We also clock on that this Dust Noir has a move called Five Nights. And it's, yes, it's exactly what you think it is. A terrible fate befalls all on the field after five turns. But we decide to chance it and see if a return can do much damage. It does just over half. Well, the five nights has begun. I don't know if we can make it till 6 a.m. Another return takes out the Dust Noir after it stalls with Protect for about four turns. Meaning that Kaido is about to get hit with the... Godless, switching doesn't matter. Okay, okay. Wait, wait, it's, it's gone. It's gone, it's gone. Oh, no, no, no! Five Nights at Friendos! Ah! Okay, the Porygon Z also takes it. Porygon Z being knocked out by its own compatriots, Five Nights at Freddy's attack. And it's at this point I realize that this is one of the greatest Pokemon games of all time. All that's left now is one Grim Snarl, which is a Dark Gamer Uno Reverse, which is eventually whittled down and defeated by the first appearance of Two Pence the Kling Clang. After a moment of contemplation and recovery, we see our next opponent, Larry. There, it's me, Larry. I serve as an Elite Four member here in Hoenn. My boss in Paldea said I was going on a paid vacation, but I think there was a translation error. Anyway, I'll be using the boring type. Let's begin. After a full-spirited speech, Larry begins the fight with a golem that lasts all of two seconds. But Unpheasant smacks back with a Brave Bird. Clearly frustrated about the fact that Golem wasn't able to do any damage, Unpheasant hits us right in the heart. It's beak piercing the hide of... Kaido, bringing Kaido's existence to a swift end. This Larry is no joke. We hatch a plan that will hopefully allow two pence to be able to knock out our opponents. A Slay King appears in front of us. This boring, stinky man only moves once every two turns. So we fire a Prime Sub, it does over half damage. But that Citrus Berry restores it to just out of range of being KO'd. But two pence is able to knock it out after a couple more Prime Subs. Then the Raticate hits the arena, which I don't, I don't know why an Elite Four member has a Raticate. That's just, I mean, come on, come on, guys. What are we doing? You really bring a rat on holiday, buddy? What's going on? And sadly, there is no Dedun Sparse for Larry to bring this time. Only sadness and loss. Three Elite Four members were down, but when we entered the final chamber, the last Elite Four member didn't seem to be around. That is until you check the old events, and yeah, no, that's a yes, yes, it's exactly, it's exactly what you think it is. It's, um, god damn it. Our last Elite Four challenge before the champion is a sus type user. This type is weak to Zuma, gamers, and really not much else. He begins the fight with an imposter ditto to steal my my bits, and we decide to set the sage appropriately. A ditto, and he just took all my stats and my moves. I don't know what's good against it. I thought it would be a sus type, but it is not the, is instead the things that I am. 
what the fuck do I do with this? Uh, so we start a battle of the shift gears. Each of us both boosting our stats, firing prime subs left and right. But the ditto got a little bit too greedy, hitting us with a prime sub, but just not enough damage after two shift gears. And then, of course, the Amoongus comes in. And this bitch is annoying. I tried to use a little bit of peer pressure on it. And oh, wait a minute. That's... That's not the Amoongus. It was a disguise the whole time. Yeah, there's the real Amoongus. I decide to imposter it with communism, but all this thing does is send you to sleep and then vent out of the Pokemon arena so it can bring something else in. And it's just, it's just really not, it's just annoying. It's just, I hate this thing. But after about 50 turns of PP stalling, we're faced with the ultimate Republican, to which I do what any true wizard does and cast Fireball. But then it switches out again and it just does this. It does this so much. Anyway, eventually Trans Rights destroys the ultimate ultimate Republican, and the sussy baka falls to the ground in defeat. And then something something eject him, eject the imposter, I don't know, some some joke about whatever, who cares. Now it was time to come face to face with the strangest champion team I've ever faced. He decides to lead with a why not? which is basically super powered in this game. It's a baby with Uno Reverse, so it's resistant to almost everything. It has a Focus Sash with Shadow Tag and can also make you into a baby using the Babify move. But you know, a great solution to a why not is to just like set up a bunch. So I went plus one billion attack with Shift Gear and just killed it with a couple gear grinds. A pretty good start to the final fight. Then Shedinja hit the floor and this thing, is the Sans type. Sans only has a few weaknesses and it's completely immune to anything that is not its weakness. It's basically Shedinja, but it has some lore accurate weaknesses like Steel, Friendship, Sharp, Zuma, Gamer, and Smash. But it's also weak to Prime. That wasn't too difficult. That's two down, only a few to go. We find that Gear Grind almost instantly annihilates Silvali, and we get hit back with a massive multi-attack, immediately annihilating two pence. The plus six attack, plus six speed had all gone down the drain. We felt a turning point in the battle as our sins crawled down our neck. I immediately go into Norman and panicking, I default to my initial option of casting Fireball. Then the space crab type Deoxys enters. Why is it a crab? I don't know why this thing's a crab. I, I don't, I have no idea. Thinking I have some kind of chance to win this, we take a Meteor Mash and Norman is immediately smashed into the ground with the power of space crabs. With a spine broken, Norman now completely unable to battle or probably move ever again. We turn once again to communism to save us, making his Deoxys our Deoxys. The enemy Deoxys goes first, starting with a crab ray, boosting its attack and speed, making it unfathomably strong. We smack it back with a crab hammer, doing just over half health, and it just manages to knock it off course enough to dodge the other Deoxys crab hammer, meaning that communism can come back in with one fell swoop and destroy it once and for all. And now it gets no easier with a Metagross landing on the scene. That crab hammer miss single-handedly saved us. Unsure of what to do in this moment, we swap into the Crobat, can do, who takes a massive iron head. It's able to deal just a small amount of damage with Air Slash before it dies to Meteor Mash, boosting the Metagross's attack. As the Metagross crumples on the destroyed body of Crobat beneath its feet, we think about our next move. Do we rely on trans rights to save us or communism? Eventually we decide, swapping into the Ditto so that it can steal the plus one attack buff that the Metagross had just gotten. The decision on which move to use weighed heavily on my shoulders, as I knew we needed to do Iron Head and Flinch, which we finally managed to do. The Metagross crab raves, tapping into the power of crabs that it should not have. And now we're left with a choice. Do we try and steal the plus one speed boost and the plus two attack boost that Metagross now has, knowing that there is one more Pokemon that is yet to enter the arena? Knowing that in order to do this, we would have to sacrifice Stronger, our magical gender friend which with her heavy heart, I make the decision to switch out. Stronger crumples under the immense power of this boosted Iron Head. Some comes back in, steals the buffs, and now it's just Latias 
versus a boosted communism. A one versus one showdown to decide who the victor will be. We've stolen his Pokemon. We've stolen his stat buffs. But can we steal a win from the last Pokemon standing? This Latias is the OU type. A type weak to very, very few types. A type that is actually resistant to my two types, Steel and Space. The Latias calms its mind as it prepares to launch an attack. We do just over half with the Iron Head and with very limited limited PP, it begins to roost, restoring its own health. We land a low roll on our next Iron Head, knowing that we need more power to be able to win. We tap once more, one final time into the power of crabs, boosting our attack and speed just one more stage, meaning that communism can land one more Iron Head squarely betwixt the eyes of the Latias, taking it down for good, allowing us to finally defeat the champion and becoming the Nuzlocke winners of Pokemon to many types. This game is really, really fun. It's got so many funny, goofy little jokes. It's not meant to be taken all that seriously. It's not like a radical red type of deal, but it is so, so fun. So massive shout out to the modders that created it, who will be linked in the description, and to Alpharad for giving the suggestion to play this game in the first place. It was incredibly fun, and if you want to see more Pokemon-related content like this, I mean, subscribe. You made it through this video. You probably do like it. Just subscribe. Just do it.